Have you ever seen a prize fight? If not, you have a pleasure to come. It is a most complete thing. It teaches men to admire true courage, to applaud generosity, to acquire notions of honor and greatness of mind. It teaches also to show humanity and not triumph over a fallen foe. Likewise, it clearly points out to despise a coward. So damned be him who first cries, hold, enough. In October 1805, an extraordinary contest took place at a secret location near London. It was violent, dangerous, and highly illegal. For the first time, a black man had entered an arena that England regarded as hers and hers alone, the bare knuckle prize ring. He was born an American slave, but he was to become an English hero. And the climax of his career was to be the greatest sporting event of the century. They called him the Black Terror. And this is his true story. Black men were a familiar sight on the streets of the nation's capital in the early 1800s. There were more than 15,000 of them in London, from all corners of the globe. Washed up sailors, traveling musicians, slaves on the run. Most of them lived in poverty, surviving on whatever charity they could find. Bill Richmond was in a different class. By the time he retired from the prize ring, Bill had the whole of London eating out of the palm of his hand. Against all odds, he'd become the world's first black superstar. The poet, Lord Byron, wrote about Bill, and even the king wanted to meet him. As for the great British public, they lapped him up. Each week, they read all about him in the underground prize-fighting magazine, Boxiana. It was published by Bill's number one fan, top boxing journalist of the day, Pierce Egan. This pugilistic hero of color stands nearly unrivaled in the prize ring. The right hand is truly dreadful. Two hits from it, applied, can produce the severity to decide a contest. Yet, however engaged in the art of milling, he is not so absorbed in fighting as to be incapable of discourse upon other subjects. He is intelligent, communicative. In fact, he can be rather facetious over a glass of Noyeux. <laughs> he is an extraordinary man. Yet when he was born, Bill's prospects in life were about as bad as they came. He was a slave. Bill and his mother lived on Staten Island near New York. They were the sole property of one Richard Charlton, the parson in a backwater known as Cuckold's Town. If he stayed put, the chances were he wouldn't make it past 35. And if he ran, he faced a beating, or worse. But when he was 13, an English aristocrat, Lord Percy, came to dine at the parsonage, and Bill spotted an opening. He's someone who's been brought up in a fairly educated household. So he's going to know how to behave around a variety of people. So he'll be accustomed to a household which has servants and slaves and masters and mistresses and how they behave in front of their social superiors. So he's going to have a degree of social skills. He's quite adroit and something of an operator. For the English nobility of the day, a black servant was a must-have fashion accessory. Lord Percy took an instant shine to the bright young slave boy. Bill is a young man who's got a bit of get up and go. What you see with him is someone who can take his chances. This is it for me, this is my big moment. God save the king. 
By catching the eye of Lord Percy, Bill had earned himself a passage to England and freedom. His new life, not a slave, but a servant at the luxurious Percy family pile, Annick Castle in Northumberland. <laughs> Thousands of English people would have been dying to get a job like that, because to get a job like that meant that you were afforded the protection of this great man. You know, you took on some of his status, you know, your status dependent on his greatness. You weren't a servant to some second-rate cheap merchant in London, you know. You had access to all the aesthetic uh, artifacts. You, uh, you, could, you could steal a bit of the sherry, you could look around at the master's books, you could admire the paintings. You know, you lived in a very genteel and ornate uh, ambience. And um, some of these black people uh, took advantage of this learned and cultured environment. Bill needed no encouragement. He taught himself to read. The general even sent him to school. And when he turned 17, Percy set Bill up as an apprentice cabinet maker in the city of York. An ambitious young black man like Bill couldn't have picked a better time to be striking out on his own. 1780 is probably the best time to have been alive in Britain as a black person, because you have a major abolition movement starting, the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Hundreds of thousands of people from all social classes went to the streets to protest on behalf of black people. I mean, it's a massive social movement that, um, that meant that there was a great deal of sympathy in this country for the ideas of justice and, and decency and, and, and fair, fairness and freedom. Bill used that freedom to establish himself as a craftsman. But on the back streets of York, the liberal mood wasn't shared by everybody. On passing through the streets of York one evening, with a female under his protection, Richmond was accosted by one Frank Myers, brothel keeper, with the epithet Black Devil. Myers insulted the young woman for being in the company of a man of colour. Bill, with a most becoming spirit of indignation, soon taught him that it was wrong and beneath the character of an Englishman to abuse an individual on account of his country or his colour. Myers, very properly, received a complete milling. By the 1790s, milling had been a popular spectacle on British streets for at least a century. If there's one thing that struck Europeans about the English in the 18th century, it was their, well, they, they saw them as being primitive and brutal, a kind of people on the edge of Europe uh, who enjoyed um, beer, beef, and boxing. And the English, in fact, reveled in this. They said, that's why British soldiers win battles, because they're used to stripping to the waist and standing firm and punching people. Uh, this makes them tough and physical, and if there's one thing that the French can't cope with, it's a tough Englishman, uh, and he's baying it. Bare-knuckle boxing was a shady world, operating on the very edge of the law. It had its own unofficial championship, contested only by Britain's toughest men. The boxing stars took on enormous status. All young boys wanted to be like the great fighters, and they knew them by name. Their vital statistics, their height, their weight, their reach were in every paper. Every schoolboy would have known all of this. The top fighters took up ring names like the Grave Digger, the Jawbreaker, and the Bristol Butcher. They were a community of heroes who fought for honor and big money. And there are various traveling shows which go around the country that people look forward to and know is going to happen. But when a fight happens, it's in a sense a bit extra to this. So the word would go around and people in communities would take the day off if they possibly could. And people would bring food out and, um, and you can just sort of hear the whole thing and jugglers would appear and fire eaters and everybody had a good time, including the pickpockets. <laughs> <laughs> 